Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our service for today for both St. Peter's and St. Oswald's. It's great that you can join with us as we worship God this morning, whether you're joining us on one of our Facebook pages or through our church website. It's great to be able to, get, great to, be able to gather together, even though it's virtual this morning, of course. So today in our cafe church service, in fact, today is the first of a two-part service, really. The first part's today, and the second part will be our cafe church service in two weeks' time. We're going to uh, be keeping a similar theme through both of uh, those services. And we're going to be exploring together a little bit about the idea of calling. What does it mean for us to be called by God in various different ways? And uh, later on in our service, in fact, Mick's going to be, Mick from St. Peter's is going to be interviewing me. Uh, and then Mick himself is going to be speaking in the service. And then later on, in the service, Mick is also going to be interviewing one of our church wardens from each of our churches. He's going to be interviewing Peter Halliday from St Oswald's and Stephen Thomas from St Peter's, who of course are two of our church wardens. So um, that's what we've got in store for us this morning. Uh, and uh, we're going to begin with a song. Uh, this is a song that speaks about um, us being open, as it were, to God's calling in our lives. We're going to be singing the hymn, Be Thou My Vision. The words will come up on the screen, so please do join in as we worship together. And then after uh, this uh, hymn, uh, we're going to go to a video of Mick interviewing me. But let's begin by singing the hymn, Be Thou My Vision. i 
Okay, well, welcome everybody. And thank you very much, John, um, for that. It's one of my favorite hymns, Be Thou My Vision. Um, so thanks very much for the opportunity of just being able to sing it. Now, today um, I, I'm interviewing Tim and I'm particularly honored because in one sense, Tim has been here and has been cumbered at St. Peter's for over 20, for, for nearly 20 years. He came in 2001. And, and in Tim allowing me to interview him, it's an opportunity just to see a bit more of Tim's heart, a bit more of, of what Tim believes he's, God has called him to. So I'm really looking forward to our interview together. So I'm just going to, I've got some questions. Tim has had the opportunity of just uh, thinking about those questions in advance. So I'm just going to be asking Tim these questions. So first question, Tim, um, is what do you understand by the term calling? Uh, I think for me, there are probably two aspects to calling. I think the first aspect is what I would sort of describe as uh, a general calling that's common to all of us. So we're all called. And I think what I mean by that is, is that is that we're all called to be followers of Jesus. We're all called to be disciples. Um, and that's the same for all of us. And I think that that is to do that's got everything to do with what it means to sort of grow as a Christian um there's obviously a second aspect which i think is the one that we tend to think probably more about in terms of calling which is a particular specific calling to an individual uh which is often probably related maybe to an occupation or to having a particular role um but i think th the focus tends to be on the second aspect and i think that's a bit of a shame actually because I actually think that the primary focus of calling should actually be the first aspect. Mm. Um, and uh, I think part of the problem with focusing on the second aspect is that for some people who might struggle with that, they say, well, I don't sense a particular calling to, as, 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 uh, according to something particular. And I think that's, that can cause difficulties for some people. And I think the two aspects are related in the sense that I think that, um, the second aspect should really flow out of the first in the sense that I think that the uh, perhaps the answer to the question for all of us, what are we all particularly called to, lies in the fact of what would help us actually fulfill the first calling? Mm -hmm. What helps each of us, and it will be different for each of us, what helps each of us to fulfill that primary calling, which is simply to be a disciple of Jesus? And there will be different particular ways for each of us, which helps us to fulfill that first one. So I think that's how I see calling. It's that sort of twin aspect and they're related. Oh, excellent, Tim. I really like the emphasis that you place on the fact that it's that first calling that helps us to fulfill the, the second. And later on, and we're going to have interviews with Peter Halliday and Stephen Thomas, uh, both from St. Oswald's and St. Peter's, and they're going to unpack this a little bit more. But coming back to you, Tim, it, uh, the second question was, what is it that you enjoy about the role that you have, that God has called you to? Uh, I think, firstly, I, I enjoy the variety of it. Uh, so, I mean, under normal circumstances, obviously it is a bit different now, but under normal circumstances, obviously, uh, you know, I would be out and about a fair bit in all sorts of different ways. Um, but also, you know, I, uh, that would obviously be true, but also I, uh, to some extent, would obviously also work from home as well. So it's the it's both of those aspects, which um, I think sort of I think it's sort of uh, it actually suits my personality type, actually, I think, when that's the case. And I think that is sort of connected with what I was saying earlier on about a calling, I think, because I think God calls us, I think, uh, as it were, in line with our personality type. I don't think he calls us to be or do something which is just totally alien to who we are. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sort of sense, it, 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 um, it, it, as it were, works for me under the normal circumstances, that mix of both being with people and also being on my own at certain times. I think if I'm being honest, I think from personality type, I would struggle if I was having to constantly be with other people. Yeah. Although perhaps some people might feel that is probably maybe what I should do. But I mean, I think I would struggle if that was the case. Um, so that mix sort of works well for me, I think. Um, so I enjoy the variety. I think also, I mean, obviously, the other aspect is that I, I enjoy the sense of hopefully feeling that I'm making some difference uh, in people's lives. And I think what I mean by that is, 
it's not not for me personally that's not so much a focus on necessarily me individually helping an individual although that obviously can be the case but I think for me it's more a question of being as a, as a vicar it's more a question of hopefully positively influencing the church community to I suppose if I was to sum it up I would go back to our church mission statement in yep. terms of building a church that focuses on Christ cares for each other and serves the local community I suppose for me as a vicar it's uh encouraging and enabling us as a community to be able to do that mm -hmm. so it's not just a question of me individually being that but it's mm -hmm. it's hopefully enabling all of us to be able to be a community that does that yeah yeah well uh, tim i i know because we've worked together since we've been coming to st peter's nearly eight years ago and uh, i think one of the things i admire about you is just what you're doing behind the scenes very often you know the classic thing you only one day a week on a sunday is when because we're, but I, I i've seen some of the amazing conscientiousness you know the, the phoning people the visiting people that the rest of us don't tend to see and even like the, the classic situation of putting the chairs back you've come in on a sunday afternoon and realigned the chairs whatever there's a lot of extra work that 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 you do tim and and i really appreciate that so and that's good just to, to hear you enjoying some of those things now it would be wonderful wouldn't it if everything was enjoyable but this is life and that we don't always enjoy everything that we do so within within the sort of um i could have put it the confidentiality of being a vicar uh, or being our vicar what what are some of the things that you find hard tim uh, I guess from a personal point of view, I mean, a, a sort of a struggle that I, I, you know, always have to some extent sort of in, within myself is a sense of coming to terms with my own shortcomings in the role, which I'm very aware of. Um, and inevitably, the sort of, as it were, the sort of the other aspect of that is is one one when one inevitably and understandably faces certain sort of criticism and. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I recognize that's part of the course. I, 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 I've, I mean, yes, from a personal point of view, I've always sort of struggled with that. Having said that, I would like to say that on the whole, people are, people are very kind and tolerant of my shortcomings. Um, so, um, which, is, which has been a great blessing, really, because I think I would have struggled otherwise. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's sort of one thing um, that I that I sort of find difficult, sort of personally. Um, I guess another sort of aspect, sort of slightly more broadly, is that um, I mean, again, it's just a sort of reality of the situation. But I think it, it, it's it's impossible, really, to completely switch off, yeah, uh, unless I'm physically away from Bishopsworth um and i mean that that's that's an inevitable part of the role and one and one that you know that i'm in many ways i'm very happy to accept mm -hmm. but i mean it's it, you know it, it is the case and i think that that sometimes i i I've, I've sometimes in my own mind i sort of i tend to sort of see the one day off a week as i tend to sort of see it as a momentary stepping off the fairground the stepping off the um play the the the, the playground Ham, so to speak. Hamster wheel or, yeah, yeah yeah exactly it's sort of you know you, you get an opportunity just to sort of step off it knowing that 24 hours you're back on it type thing mm -hmm. i mean that sounds a bit that sounds sort of a bit the, the merry-go-round that sounds a bit negative but but um you only really get i think you i i feel that i you can only really relax out of role if i can put it that way yeah when you're when you're physically away from the vicarage because you're 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 always only you're always only a phone call or a doorbell away from something yeah. even if even if it even if you're not officially working as such yeah uh, things can always impinge it, it's literally a 24 7 isn't it really and and as you say even if it is when the church alarm goes off in the middle <laughs> of the night <laughs> <laughs> that's when it does become 24 7 yeah yeah at all hours of the night i could have added that one in <laughs> you, you and martin and, and others as well martin's very good on that 
but it, but there is a sense, isn't it, where getting it mentally out of your head, and it's and so the practicality for you is just being away from Bishopsworth because that just gives you some boundaries, and I can really understand that, Tim, because it does it gets into your mindset, and it's very difficult not to. Okay, I'm thinking particularly of mindsets and and the way that COVID has so affected us this last year. It's obviously affected you enormously because this is your primary role in terms of Vic. We've not been able to have the church open the way we'd like to, the congregation not been able to mix all those kind of things we've not been able to do. But for you personally, Tim, what is it that's kept you going amidst the COVID restrictions? I think I think in general terms, uh, it's it's what it's having what I I was sort of trying to sort of think about this and I think it's it's having what I would sort of see as, if I can describe it this way, as a sort of a godly sense of balance and perspective on everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I mean by that is, is that on the one hand, I recognize that, you know, in the particular role that I have, you know, you know, the importance of that, you know, I recognize the importance of it, obviously. Um, but I think also there's a sense in which I, Although that is true, I think generally speaking, I try to also sit in a sense lightly to that mm -hmm. and try to encourage other people to sit lightly to it rather than having an overinflated sense of my importance, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think for me personally, uh, and something that I, I suppose I do find helpful just inwardly from a personal point of view, uh, in terms of helping me to cope, I, I think is, is humour. Um, I think, um, you know, humour can be hopefully helpful in terms of just getting a bit of perspective on things mm. and... Uh, not getting an overinflated sense of importance about a particular issue which perhaps isn't quite as important as yes. we might like to think it is firstly yeah. Yeah. so um and so i suppose coupled with that is you know within that i think is a recognition that um you know ultimately god's in charge and i think i need to realize that it's not it's not ultimately down to me yeah, I, I, and I think that can be a temptation either for me or others to think that it is. Yes. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, but I think ultimately I need to recognise that God's in charge and and and, and not me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on a slightly lighter note, in terms of what keeps me going, I think it's also important. I think to have other interests. Actually, mm. uh, I think you know it's important not to be totally, uh, totally, uh, you know. Uh, so immersed in something that you've got no other interests in life so i mean all i can say is that cricket and pop music especially the beatles have served me well yes yes and we're waiting to see you on mastermind with your specialist subject of the beatles well i'd give them all a run for their money i'm I, sure you would too that'd be a bit of a problem on the general knowledge front but um <laughs> But I, I think that that penultimate point that you made, Tim, just just about realizing not in control. I think sometimes we only realize that when our control is taken away. And what COVID has done is it has taken away uh, control, hasn't it, from for many of us yeah. in different situations. And I think that is such a wise comment to for you for you to step back and say, well, actually, I was never in control. Yeah. But I thought I was. And, and you come to that kind of realization, and I'm sure, like for me, a continual reminder that actually we are not in control. It is God who is in control, and it's not easy to, to do that. Um, excellent. Well, Tim, thank you very much for being willing for me just to sort of question you in this kind of way, um, and we'll pick up some of these things later on in the service. So thanks very much indeed, Tim. Thanks a lot, Meg. Thanks very much, Tim, for just allowing me to interview you about this idea of calling. And when we think about the word calling, I wonder what is it that comes to your mind when you think of the word calling? Certainly when I was thinking about this subject, I thought of, would you believe it, Avon calling? And a little sort of ding-dong in my mind, because that's something in my sort of background that I was familiar with. But I first began to think about this area of calling when I began my, my training to become a lay minister. And in that preparation for training, people began to say to me, are you called to become a lay minister? 
And it confused me because part of me thought, well, no, as I sat down with Tim and we talked about my future and possible role here at St. Peter's, there was a sense that this just seemed to be the next step. So what has it got to do with calling? And so I began to think a bit more about this whole area of calling and trying to sort of think, what is it? Have I missed something here? Is there something more in terms of this role than I've thought about? And as I began to explore this issue of calling, there are three broad categories that certainly came into my mind. The first one is God's universal call to all of humanity to know and to love him. God's universal call to everybody to know and to love him. And in the very first, chap very first book of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, we hear about God calling Adam and Eve. Where are you? He said. And that kind of a call. In Romans chapter 1, we read that God's invisible nature is clearly perceived in the things around us. Uh, he, we, can see, we can clearly see him. We were made to worship. God calls us to worship. And if we won't worship God, we will worship something. So the first aspect of calling is God's universal call to all mankind, all humanity, to respond to him. The second aspect of call that I came across was a particular, of God's calling to a particular people to respond to him in faith and worship and loving service. And initially, as we read the Bible, it was the Jewish people. And then through Jesus Christ, God calls the church to show his character and love to the whole world so that the whole world might know and love him. And so this second aspect of calling is to be a disciple, a follower of Christ, wherever we are, whatever stage of life we are in. To be a disciple of Christ as a parent, as a father, as a mother, as a grandparent, as a husband, as a wife, whether we're unwell, healthy, wealthy, or poor. So that second aspect is God specifically calling his church to be a people of God that would witness to him in our world and invite the world to listen to his general calling <coughs> to them. And then the third aspect of calling was calling to a particular role or office. And uh, there's a French theologian called John Calvin who was around in the 1500s and he taught that all men and women have a calling in life, that it is their duty to investigate the gifts and circumstances of their lives, to discover and exercise that calling to the glory of God. Now that teaching at the time was revolutionary and it gave a great deal of joy to the poor people who thought that calling only referred to the priests in the church, only they were the ones that were called. But John Calvin's teaching actually encouraged him to say, in your situations, whether you're a farmer or whatever it was you were doing, God was calling you to serve him. So how do we discover our calling to a particular office or role? Well, it's a really complex area. And I'm going to give you just three words in the hope that these three words sort of capture something for you and give you some kind of signposts to be able to sort of think about God's calling for you. The first word is this, real. What I mean by real is not pretending. And what I mean by not pretending is to really face your situation to think, is there more enjoyment than struggle in my current situation? Or is there more struggle than enjoyment? This aspect of facing the reality of what we're thinking and feeling about our job is a really interesting way of thinking, what is happening to me? Am I enjoying this or not? And as I was preparing this, Caroline, my wife, just reminded me of that uh, Olympic runner, Eric Liddell. Many of you are familiar with him from Chariots of Fire. And when he was running, he said, when I run, I feel his pleasure. That sense of enjoyment, when he was doing that sport, he felt God's hand on his life and he felt God's pleasure as he began to do that. So to be real in your situation, what am I facing? Am I enjoying this job, this role that I have? Or actually am I frustrated by it? And what's the blend between the two? And that aspect of trying to be real with that opens that door. Some of you will know very well our friend Tiz, who's been in Canada since the lockdown. And when Tiz was going through a really difficult time, people were asking Tiz, how are you Tiz? And Tiz would say, I'm fine, I'm fine. 
And then to a trusted few, she opened up and she would say, when I say I'm fine, what I mean is that I'm frustrated, I'm irritable, I'm neurotic, I'm exhausted. F-I-N-E. And for tears, she just let a few people into her world to say, that's what I'm really like. But I can't say that to everybody. But I'm saying I'm being real to a few of you so, so you can understand a little bit more. So the first word I want to leave with you is to be real. The second word I want to leave with you is to be realistic. Realistic. This lockdown has blocked us from connecting with others as usual, working as usual, traveling as usual, even grieving as usual. And rather than be hard on ourselves and others, what can we realistically do? How do we think less about what we can do and just say, well, I can do this. I can't meet with people, but perhaps I could phone them. Perhaps I could write a letter. Perhaps I could drop a text. What realistically can we do in our particular situation? And the third thing I just want to say, and the final thing, is the word realise. What is it that we're to realise? I've said that we need to be real, ideally, we need to be realistic, but we need to realise. What is it we need to realise? And I'm going to say something to you that I, I don't often hear. I'm going to say to realise that God is thrilled with you. God is thrilled with you. Now even as I say that, I'm thinking, do I, really, do I really believe that? God is thrilled with me? Let me just tell you a story about a boy and a boat. A young boy made this wonderful boat. He was quite keen on sailing on the local pond and he made this wonderful boat and his dad helped him and he made it out of balsa wood. He did the sails, he painted it and the day came when they were going to actually float it on the local boating little boating area. And so he took the boat on and he watched it and he watched the wind fill the sails and he watched it go around and he thought, I wonder if we could take it out onto a bigger, a bigger reservoir perhaps. And so they took it onto the bigger reservoir and this little boy just watched his boat go and he held onto the string and he got so excited that he let go of the string and the boat just sailed off far away out of his reach and he watched the boat just disappear from what he could see and he was so sad. This was his boat and he was so sad about that. And as the days went on, and so he wondered about whether to build another boat or not, and he was walking by one of these shops, these pawnbroker shops, and in the window he saw his boat. And he, 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 he banged on his, his dad was with him, and he said, that, that's my boat, that's the boat that you and I made, that's my boat. And they went into the shop, and he said, that's my boat. And the owner said, I'm sorry son, but I pay for that, so I'm sorry, I can't give it to you, you're going to you're gonna have to buy it if you want it back. And the boy went out and talked it over with his mum and dad and uh, they said, well look, perhaps you could save up the pocket money and so on. And so he began to save and he did some extra jobs and so on. And then when he, he got enough money, he went back to the shop and the boat was still there and he went and he bought it. And as he came out the shop holding this boat, he said, you are twice mine. I created you and I bought it. And that's what God says to us, that we are twice his. He created us and he bought us with the precious blood of Christ. God is thrilled with us. And as we think about whatever role we might be playing, whatever God, office God might be calling us to, he is thrilled that you have a relationship with him. He is thrilled that you're seeking him. He is thrilled that he knows you and he longs for you to know him more. Let's just pray. Father, would you help us just to think about these areas of being called? Father, you've called us to be part of your kingdom. You've called the world to respond to you. And Father, as we pray, we ask that you would help us to be open and receptive to what it means to be real, what it means to be realistic, what it means to realise that you are thrilled with us. Our next hymn is, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. And it speaks of our desire to worship God. And as we sing this, let's just do that prayerfully and lift our hearts to the God who is thrilled with us.
John for leading us in that song. I'm going to hand over to Mick again. Uh, Mick's done another Zoom interview uh, with uh, two of our church wardens, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, Stephen Thomas obviously from St Peter's and uh, Peter Halliday from St Oswald's and uh, uh, Mick has interviewed them on how they understand calling, their calling by God to their different, their different roles. So I'm going to hand over to Mick and then after that interview Jenny Neal is going to lead us in our prayer. Okay, well, welcome back, uh, everybody. And uh, I'm really privileged, um, feel very privileged to have Peter here from St. Oswald's and Stephen here from St. Peter's. And in the same way that I interviewed Tim earlier on about this issue of calling, so I'm going to ask Stephen and Peter just to give their impression on some of the questions that I asked uh, Tim uh, earlier on in the service. Um, so as we get into this, I'm going to ask Stephen to begin with. So, Stephen, what do you understand by the term calling? My, my summary of calling is an action that you enjoy doing yeah. combined with something you feel you would do well. Also, making sure you have the time to do it. Right. right. Now, I worked for Lloyds Bank for 26 years and I did a myriad of jobs and one of the jobs was they were asking for people to go to Jersey and they wanted 50 people to work in Jersey mm -hmm. and 3,500 applied. But I felt that I was being pushed towards that course of action. And I can't explain to you why. And whilst in Jersey, my first secretary was Vanessa. Whoa. So I took her to church on Sunday, followed by a night restaurant afterwards. And that is how I met my wife. And we've been married 31 years. And I still do 
the household finances. <laughs> so, Stephen, following your call, I really like the breadth of the, your definition of calling. If I can get it right, it was, it was something you enjoy doing, something that you can do well and something you've got the time to do. And you following your calling in a bank, actually, not in a sort of Christian ministry, but in a bank, actually um, led to you actually discovering Vanessa and, and long term benefits from that. Yes. Yeah. Let me just go back to you, Peter. I mean, do you, do you have a view on this aspect of calling? Um, we're calling. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it's a strong urge towards something. I think the problem um, with calling with the church um, yeah. is um, people see it uh, where people come through the door. Have you been called to us? You've been called to us. People from the outside, it's a very frightening thing to say. And if there's people who have been called uh, or saying, yes, I've been called, you're going to have other people in the background going, have I been called? You know, do they really want me? And I think it can be quite an off-putting um, way of uh, actually <laughs> being called. It uh, can, can off-put a lot, lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Because I suppose the more that we use that, the more that people think, well, I'm not called. You, know, yeah. you have been and I'm not and they move themselves out of the equation and God of course calls everybody so that's really good perspective Peter thank you and just coming back to you Stephen just very quickly could you give us just one thing uh, one thing that you enjoy about what you do as church warden at uh, St Peter's I enjoy being at the beginning of ideas like like a blossoming flower you um I I, I really do like seeing something germinate and um, come to fruition great oh that, that that's excellent and of course I've, I've i've been interacted with you in terms of the church standing committee and so on and seen just some of your excellent questions in that context Stephen. and and pete over to you peter rather um what is it just one thing that that you enjoy about your role as church warden at st oswald's it's actually meeting the different people not just in the congregation but actually out in the community um yeah. Uh, we lost our vicar uh what's it eight nine years ago and um we have been working with the community um this year for the um, i've been church warden for um more or less 22 years now and wow. i've been getting the christmas tree uh every year this year um i spoke with the pcc and the congregation i said well i'm gonna buy a christmas tree but i don't see the point of putting it inside a building in which we have no groups to be able to see it, so we put it outside. Um, what we didn't expect is um, we thought, well, people could decorate it, and then somebody from our congregation suggested and made a load of tags, wooden tags, to hang on the tree. Um, within two weeks, over 70 tags had actually gone onto the tree, countless decorations with um, dedications to people, and it wasn't just people that had passed on, but people who were living who live in other countries or other parts of the country in which the families this year can't see um and it also bought it was really nice the community said well have you thought of a carol service um it, we we only had about six days notice to be able to organize it because we had to listen to what the government was saying and what were the legal lockdowns and sort it but we put it out it's in six days time we do a carol service right. um we had a, 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 in excess of 100 people turn up all in their own bubbles across the Bems are down all singing and these are people that aren't known as congregation and um it was so encouraging um it looks like we'll probably be doing that for uh, the next few years fantastic peter fantastic i mean that, that's just seeing god at work isn't it through through just putting the tree outside and, and god bringing people together that's really great now I, you know i know like you do you both do that it'd be lovely to do everything that you enjoy but in your roles and i've had a similar kind of role there are sometimes things that are just hard to do so coming back to you steve just just one, one thing that that you find hard in your particular role i find hard juggling my diary because I've got to see the doctor two or three times a month yeah. and I've got to look after my grandchildren mm. and I've got to go shopping for my stepmother-in-law. So um, the, juggling that yeah. <laughs> um, and the current situation with lockdown um, means that we aren't able to move forward in ways that we previously wished to yeah 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 no i and that and Stephen, you know just the, the things that you do juggle with you know 
can I say on behalf of the people of St. Peter's that it's it really appreciate the time that you do give because there all of us have got other things to do as well. How about you, Peter? Over to you. What what what's one of the things you find hard in your role at St. Oswald's? The main thing is is trying to please everybody. Um, as I said, I've been at church. I was christened at St. Oswald's um, back in 1974 when I was born. My father was church warden as well um, back uh, then in the late 70s. And it's, it's pleasing people because you'll have one side in which this is the way we've always done it. And then you have another set of people in which want to move radically to, to another side. And it's actually trying to juggle the lot when we yeah. actually um lost the full you know 100 percent vicar it actually it's actually helped us um where we have two communion services when we're open properly two communion services one um sometimes traditional we used to do a uh, book of common prayer something like that then we'd have more of a modern communion service um with the other services um it's given us such an outreach to be able to please different groups and we have a fourth Sunday in which has been going for several years now, in which we have people from places like United Reformed Church, the Methodist, of other churches that have shut, that have actually come to that service because it's it's more what um, they want. So yeah. it's actually been a blessing in disguise. Oh, brilliant. And, and um, what I'm hearing from you both is that for Stephen, it's juggling priorities. And for you, Peter, it's juggling people. Yes. You know, for both of you sort of wrestling with those things. Just as we, we finish our interview, just one final thing. What is it that keeps you going? These have been difficult times. I don't know how you found it. I suppose my impression for myself and others is that this third lockdown has really pushed us hard. It's really pushed us in terms of being discouraged and, and all kinds of things. So so for people listening in, just one tip from both of you, you know, from what, you, not, not for them, but what is it that keeps you going, really? Keeps you going, yeah. Um, by Bible study, mm. um, although it's only with my wife, mm -hmm. I still enjoy doing the Bible study, but I would prefer a group of 10. And the knowledge that there are people behind me, yeah. like the vicar, like the other warden and lay readers, and people within the diocese who can support and show me new ways of doing things. Oh, fantastic, Stephen. And, and Peter, for you? Um, well, it's, um, it's actually keeping the, 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 the church open for um, individual prayer. It's been um, made very apparent that some people really need it. The services that have been going out. Um, we have a gentleman that watches every week um, from Australia, Mr Pritchard, um, who always comments and enjoys it. Um, a couple of Sundays ago, we had a two-minute silence for... Um, Captain Sir Tom Moore and everybody that's been affected by COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. It went, went out online and it got picked up by a major news agency, media outlet. And we've had um, in excess of 11 to 12,000 people actually view it um, with um, four and a half to 5,000 people's comments on, on, the, uh, on that. It's been, you know, it's been mind blowing. I've been working ever since the start of lockdown. Uh, we've been, um, I've been working on the COVID hot centres, uh, working with the NHS government agencies and late, latterly setting up the vaccination centres. So it's, you know, uh, to me, it's been hand in glove and the positive stuff that I'm getting um, for the job I'm doing and the job at the church, um, it, it's been very, it proves there's a lot of nice people. There's more nice people out there than there's not. Yes. Well, and, and we do need to be reminded of that, Peter. That That's excellent. Thank you both very much indeed. And on behalf of, of St. Peter's, and, and I don't know many people, so, but I'm sure they'd, they'd be with me in terms of thanking you both for the enormous work that you do as church wardens. And, and not just as church wardens, but being called to do the different things that you do as well. So thank you both very much indeed. And so we come to God bringing our prayers and requests into his presence. For you alone, Lord, are strong to save and mighty to heal, full of mercy and compassion and knowing our every need. We're now in a time of Lent, a time of reflection when we think more deeply about our lives and what it really means to be a Christian. Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners to repentance. 
You came to call those who realise and admit their own sinfulness and weakness. Those who seek your forgiveness and your grace. And when you call them, you also change them to become humble, thankful people who rejoice in following you. Help us to hear and respond to your call and by your Holy Spirit, change us every day that we may become more like you in every way, more Christ-like, more loving, stronger in faith. We pray for all those who have heard your call and committed themselves to serve in your church and in the world. For those called to share the gospel with others, by their words, witness and the example of their lives. We remember all those who serve in your churches of St Peter's and St Oswald's in many different ways, often unnoticed or unrecognised by others, but always precious and valued in your sight, Lord. We thank you for all who've been called to care for others as teachers caring for children, as doctors and nurses caring for the sick, for social workers, care home workers and home helps. And there are many others who find ways of helping and serving others, bringing joy and blessing to those in need. Thank you for all those who give generously of their time, money, skills or energy to help others less fortunate than themselves. And we've seen many examples of this over these past months of the pandemic crisis. Help us all to live as generously and freely as we have received so bountifully from you, Lord. Lord, we pray for governments and all those in positions of authority. Lord, give them the wisdom that comes from heaven, the insight to see problems and issues clearly, and the courage and will to act in ways that are right and good for the benefit of society as a whole. Help them especially to make careful decisions in this time of lockdown, to know what measures to put in place to protect both people's lives and livelihoods. Help them to know the impact of the decisions they make. Lord, we thank you that so many people in this country have already received their first vaccination. We pray that as more and more people are protected, that the virus will gradually become less deadly and widespread so that we can eventually begin to take up our normal lives again, travelling, working, socialising and meeting up with loved ones. Father, we are mindful of all those we know who are sick or suffering or in any kind of need. <clears throat> we bring them before you, Lord, remembering them in our hearts and thinking especially of all those on our church's prayer list. May they know your help, and your healing. May they know your peace in their hearts and the assurance of your loving presence with them in all their troubles. And lastly, we bring ourselves and our loved ones before you. Bless our homes and families. May they be places of safety, peace and joy, where all are loved, valued, and cared for, and where Christ is honoured as Lord. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jenny, for leading us in our prayers, and thank you to Stephen and Peter for being willing to be interviewed by Mick. I'd like to take this opportunity on your behalf of thanking all of our four church wardens in our two churches. A huge thank you to Stephen and Martin, and to Peter and Phil, 
uh, for all their hard work as wardens of St Peter's and St Oswald's. It's been, as you will appreciate, a particularly challenging year this past year in all sorts of different ways and the wardens have done a fantastic job uh, behind the scenes in all that still needs to continue, of course, uh, in both of our churches. So thank you to all of you for all your hard work. So, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we're going to carry on this theme of calling in our cafe church service in two weeks' time. Uh, next week, as many of you will be aware, uh, we're going to be joined virtually by our bishop, Bishop Viv, the Bishop of Bristol. She's going to be preaching in our service. It will, of course, be a pre-recorded uh, service because, uh, obviously, we're still in lockdown. Um, but Bishop Viv will be recording a sermon. Uh, and what we're, it's, next Sunday is going to be a little bit different in the sense that Bishop Viv is still very keen to meet with us, even though it's obviously virtual. So what's going to happen next week is that we're encouraging everyone, if possible, to actually engage with and watch the service live at 10.30, although it's obviously pre-recorded. So it's going to be, there's going to be a Zoom code that I will be sending out to both churches uh, so that you can log on to the Zoom code, so that we can all watch the service together live at 10.30. Because then after that service, Bishop Viv would very much like to have coffee with us uh, over Zoom, as it were. So please do join us next Sunday. I realise that uh, many of us are engaging with the services, obviously, at all sorts of different times during the week, not necessarily uh, on Sundays at 10.30. But for next Sunday, if you could... Uh, make a note in your diaries, as it were, uh, to join us at 10.30 so that we can watch it together and then meet with Bishop Viv afterwards over coffee. That will be great. And as I say, I will be sending uh, everyone in both churches the Zoom code for that meeting. So please do join us next Sunday. And then, as I said, the following Sunday in two weeks' time, we're going to pick up this theme again of calling in our cafe church service. So as, we begin, so as we draw to a close uh, this morning, perhaps we can just spend a moment in quiet together and, uh, and then perhaps wherever we are, we can just pray for each other in the words of the grace. So let's just have a moment of quiet together. And let's pray for each other in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining us in worship this morning. Uh, we're going to finish with a song. This is a song that uh, some people's music group have recorded for us. Uh, so please do join in with the words on the screen as we sing together as we close in Christ alone my hope is found. Oh, from the grave he rose again, and as he 
stands in victory Since Christ has lost its grip on me For I am His and He is mine Bought with the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me 